The Holy Gospel is written in the fifth chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the first verse. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the gospel for the day. Please be seated. I think that probably all of you will agree there is a lot of craziness in this world. A lot of crazy stuff going on by what is being done and by what is being said. So let us talk a little bit about craziness today because it fits in real well with the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. Mariah Carey the soloist, the singer, was doing a spot for the starving children in Africa. And she was went through her little routine in the recording, and then she was asked by a interviewer after her session was done. And they asked how she felt about her session. And she says, well, you know, when I saw those starving little children, I really had to sit down and cry. Well, mind you, we would all like to be as skinny as they are, but without the flies and the death. Real great response. Bill Gullickson was one of those when, when it became popular for a lot of the American baseball players that didn't quite make it into the major leagues, went to Japan and got to be involved in Japanese teams, Bill Gullickson was one that went. When he was asked, when he came back, what was the toughest thing about operating in a foreign culture, he said, well, the language. And they said, did you have a lot of trouble with the language? And he said, well, yes, I did. The only two English words I knew were Sony and Mitsubishi. <laughs> right. Japanese, the only English words. Crazy. Crazy stuff. College professor Roger Pelton has done research on a lot of laws that have been passed in regard to behavior in and around churches. For instance, the young girls in Wheeler, Mississippi are not allowed to walk on tight ropes unless they are in church. The Blackwater, Kentucky people put this law into the books, tickling a woman under the chin with a feather duster will invoke one day in jail and a $10 fine. Honey Creek, Iowa, no one can take a slingshot into ch church except the policeman. Nothing about assault weapons, but a slingshot can only be carried by an officer of the law. Lee Creek, Arkansas. You cannot attend church in any of red colored garments. Well, what do they do with Pentecost? I don't know. 
and why red is the disgusted color. I don't know. I have an idea, and you probably do too. Studley, Virginia. There is no use of a yo-yo permitted either in church or in the city during Sunday, on Sunday. No yo-yo. Slaughter, Louisiana. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of any church at any time. Those all seem like reasonable things, don't they? But those have become laws in, in established communities. And nobody has seen the silliness of it and taken it off the books. Or maybe it still is an important thing. I don't know. But it's some of those crazy things that happen in our society. Well, I know there's one thing that well, you will agree with me because it is much more current than those laws that I read to you, and that is the language police. Because you really have to be careful what you say right now because anything offends. It doesn't matter what it is. It offends somebody. And so you finally find yourself corrected for saying somebody from the wrong area of the country or wrong country or casting dispersion on the country. There was an article written by Quinn Hillier just last week in the Washington Examiner, and he talked about some new words that become forbidden. Aloha, hola, and shalom to all your readers for whatever field you are going during the picnics you enjoy are now forbidden. I use that greeting, aloha, hola, or shalom, very carefully because right now the language police are warning us that unless you are Hawaiian, Spanish, and Jewish, you are disrespecting their country by pretending you know it. Field is also forbidden because it might invoke slavery, while picnic could not could be associated with lynching parties. To the scolding people, the policing, uh, the the language policeman, it matters not if the actual derivation of the word has no remotely offensive origin, much less whether the uh, whether you be offended, whether you might be offended. But we, if someone somehow might be offended, then we must erase commonly used words from our vocabulary and replace them with awkward jargon. It is true that some of the old terms can contain offensive meanings, and we should all avoid rudeness. But if field, aloha, bring the hatchet offends you, then it's you who have the problem. Stanford University IT department has even war warned against using the word of American since it excludes South and Central America. He concludes the article with how about some common sense. And I've heard many people within this congregation make the same claim that this is all malarkey. It's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. And yet the people who are supporting and policing it are very serious about it. And they think right now, even in many of the churches, that it is something that has to be very carefully, very carefully thought about before you say anything at all. Probably even the hymns that you sing. Because really, Onward Christian Soldiers does offend some people who think it's too much of a military song for the church. Now, if you want to get even more ridiculous, think about some of the country western songs. I don't know if you listen to them, but I turn on Willie Nelson Station, a Sirius satellite radio, and there are some interesting ones that have come. For instance, Tom T. Hall has a song called, called Faster Horses. Have you ever heard of it? It's about a person who uh, pretends to be a poet. And he talks to a lot of people about their philosophy of life. And this one person that he meets on the train, 
he asks because he seems uh, res uh, responsible, he asks him what his philosophy of life is. And he responds, faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. Now you might laugh at that, but that probably is the philosophy of life of a great many people. Um, uh, there's another song called The Gambler. He, and he, he also has a philosophy of life. He said, you got to know when to hold, you got to know when to fold, know when to walk away, and when to run. Never count your money till you're, till you're, well, uh, well, you never count the money at the table. There'll be plenty of time for that when the dealing's done. And he concludes with every gambler knows the secret to survival. Know when to throw things away, know what to keep. For every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. And the best you can hope for is to die in your sleep. Those are philosophical statements and they are very real philosophical statements by so many people. I guess that's why there's so much despair in the world. I know myself that I have said one of the things that I desire most is to die quietly in my sleep, but it's not the most I hope for. Okay, so we're talking about some really crazy things. <coughs> but if you talk about really crazy things, go to the Sermon on the Mount. Have you read the Sermon on the Mount lately? Well, today we had the Beatitudes, which is the beginning of that three-chapter discourse of Jesus that talks about most of the things that he taught and was concerned about. <laughs> But read them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And by the way, that word blessed in Greek is very often translated happy. In the newer translations of the Bible, instead of blessed are the poor in spirit, it says happy are the poor in spirit. So I'm going to use that word and substitute it here in our text from today. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit. How would you like to be asking for poor, being poor in spirit? Isn't that contrary to what we are teaching? Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, that's likely a good thing, but how can somebody who is mourning be happy? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Yeah. Somebody, one of the comedians said, uh, I... I I was meek and I inherited the earth, but what I got was New York City. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after right, or happy are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. How many of these things have you sat down at the end of the day or said in the morning prayer assessing what you were going to do for the day? How many of you have asked for those qualities, for those attributes that are pigeonholed on the Sermon on the Mount and particularly in the Beatitudes? As I was studying for this uh, today or uh, during the week, I thought really each one of these beatitudes is really should be the subject of one sermon apiece but let us just run over them really quickly first of all poor in spirit what does that mean really it means a little humility and being not haughty Russell Fears, who is, teaches at the University of Oklahoma, actually doesn't teach anymore, he's passed away. 
But he talked about every great civilization that has risen and fallen has fallen because of one reason. And the word they use is hubris. And that's um, unbridled arrogance that cares for nobody else or nobody else's opinion. He said that has been the reason for every fall of every great empire. And he says that will be the fall of this empire as well if we don't put it in check. To be humble and to understand that we are an interdependent people, that we can't do it by ourselves. There's nothing better that you can have in life than to understand you can't do it by yourself that you need others, and you need to be a part of other people's lives because they need you too. Blessed are they that mourn. Is mourning something good? We don't like to cry. We don't like to have negative feelings to the point where we are weeping outwardly. But if you haven't experienced pain, if you haven't experienced being in a place where you really had to mourn, you can't really be effective to anybody else, particularly in their moments of despair. To be truly human and to be a person that understands God's purposes, you have to have gone through some tragedy, probably experiencing death a number of times with people who are very close. Some suffering Sensitivity starts with experiencing the suffering of other people. Blessed are the meek. Now, I was thinking about these professional football playoffs today, and if they went to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, this is what their pep talk would sound like in the locker room. Players were not really concerned about winning today, we want to show the world good sportsmanship, and that's the most important. I don't care if you win or not, just be good sports about it. And don't be too tough. Be meek and mild. And don't hit anybody too rough. And particularly don't target the quarterback or the kicker because they are most vulnerable. And if we see anybody being too tough on our opponents, we're just going to pull them and bench them. Do not argue with officials because they are the authority. And be a little humble in just understanding that if they call a wrong call on your play, just accept it and be nice about it. And no penalties. Please don't do anything that will upset the officials. And if you're too aggressive and you cause a penalty or jump offside, we will bench you because we do not want aggressive people out there playing on our team. That's kind of what it would sound like, right? If we read Sermon on the Mount. Well, meek simply means to be calm, cool, and, and corrected. Prime examples of people who achieved great things by being meek and mild was Gandhi, who gained India's independence with nonviolence. Martin Luther King, who saved a nation that was sharply divided and was just about to blow up by his sacrifice and by his message of Gandhi, nonviolent, he saved a nation, which is ours. Nelson Mandela ended apartheid. Well, he suffered. He, he, slowed down apartheid in South Africa and made it an independent nation with equal rights. They were meek. Hungering and thirst after righteousness. I don't think most of us think of us as being really super righteous people. But righteousness is just doing the right thing. One of the people that uh, monitors one of the radio programs on FM at the end of his session, he said, as we close now, go out and be kind. For God's sake, it's the right thing to do. And that's the hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
Merciful, well, that's simply obeying the golden rule. And chances are, if you take that golden rule and say, I will do other to others what I expect them to do to me, what I would like them to do to me, then I think things will probably go better in troubled relationships. The pure in heart simply means don't dwell on the negative. Look for the positive. It's so easy to find fault with everybody, and we can. You only need about three minutes with me to find my faults, and I do the same with you. But let's not look at the negative. The things that we have in common, the things that we share. I had a visitor come to the church and they saw a cars parked out here. And they looked at one and they said, man, it's easy to tell who these uh, people, what political party they belong to. Look at sign in one and look at the sign in the other. They're just direct opposites. What do you think about that? I said, I think it's great that we have a church it contain people who are direct opposites could sit down and pray together because it's probably the only thing they do that's positive. Peacemakers. Two different sides. But I can't think of anything better than being a peacemaker, but we don't put a high priority on peacemaking. We make a strong emphasis on getting what we want, what we would like. Dr. Seuss has pictured this so well in the, in the story of the two Zaxes, the south going Zax and the north going Zax, who are coming in opposite directions and they meet. And you go through about four or five pages that they would step neither to the right nor to the left. They were just bent on going where they wanted to go. And what happened is that they built a town around them and they are still there arguing about who is right or who should get his way. Blessed are those that are persecuted for Christianity. We don't like that even. We don't like to be persecuted for our faith, do we? I found myself doing this one time. I remember back in my childhood when one of the Catholic basketball players in the, on the opposing team went to the free throw line and crossed himself. And afterwards, I was kind of indignant and I said, do you really think that God is going to help you make that basket because you crossed yourself? And he said, no, what I'm saying is that I don't even have the power to make that basket without God's help. I never criticize anybody for making the sign of the cross. And a matter of fact, sometimes I do it, recognizing that I can't do anything without God's help. Beatitudes seem so crazy, don't they? And are they crazy? Or are they just guidelines for life? Simple ones that really, really tell the story. I think they're things that are life-changing transformations of adjusted spirits, both mentally and spiritually. Our official text talks about God's foolishness being wiser than human wisdom. And it's in the foolish things we do and what we consider foolish and what we consider normal and okay. That makes the difference between wisdom and stupidity. May you all be wise people. Obey the attitudes, the beatitudes. Amen. Let us confess, oh wait, we have the second hymn, and where did I put that? What is it? 448, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, 448. 